think probably I think uh, my topic is I think the segment developmental and normally challenges and all the earlier speakers have almost comprehensively covered everything so I just thought I'll give you a, a, a I'll run through a case based approach of a surgery and uh, we will halt in between to just discuss the particular uh, challenges given the restraint of time here. Yeah. So this is pretty much similar to the case which you showed uh, Murli here and uh, here you could see it's very difficult even to measure this cornea and find out what exactly is, you know, do I measure it from here to here or do I measure it from here to here. You do find some amount of, you know, corneal tissue like morphology which is there and you will rightly show I had a similar picture and you could see the conjunctival insertion is much anterior here. The, uh, the limbal anatomy is distorted though you could see some uh, uh, something similar to, uh, to palisades of bones okay. over here we do find here and also this is particularly the corneal diameter measurement itself is difficult in these the corneal diameter is smaller they are all like microcorneas here, here and you also do not know and when you do image on an IOCT it doesn't go deeper than the cornea so imaging the anterior segment so you will have to have UBM to look at these pictures. So this is a particular difficulty pre-operatively itself that how would you really go about defining the anatomy in these particular patients here. And I think you have worked on looking at the imaging along with Ken Nestor on uh, using a, a specialized uh, UBM device or the one which you use for doing uh, venous imaging here where you probably will be able to pick up an anomalous uh, limbus in these patients and then see. So that is always intriguing to know which of these are going to survive and which of these are not going to survive. It still uh, leads me to define uh, what my outcome is going to be in these cases. So that was the starting difficulty I had on this particular case which I recently operated at this last week here. And so measuring and really tending to design, though I did have a preoperative uh, UBM which was performed by my senior resident to help me in defining the, uh, the, the exact anatomy here. So but then when I went in, you see the IOCT imaging here, you do see the cornea is uh, significantly thickened here and uh, we are not able to make out the deeper structures in an IOCT but we were able to and it shows a, a, dif uh, it shows a different image where the deeper structures seem to appear normal or you have something like an angle which you can see in these patients here. So I, I went ahead and you see it does bleed profusely here, you have a lot of vessels and you are really skeptical but then uh, as uh, pediatric cornea surgeons uh, we always want to give them as much vision as possible if you can and for as long as you want to give them so that the visual axis is at least clear in the initial phases when uh, vision is developing, the pathway is developing and another particular difficulty is because of the, of the thickness which is associated you definitely land up getting peripheral ledges when you are doing surgeries in these cases here. So, uh, looking at this and uh, I'll tell you why it is, uh, that the UBM showed me probably a normal angle in certain places. So, I was trying to define where I'm having a, an angle anatomy. So, what you find in this case, the iris is anomalous as well and the moment you even gently put in your, your, uh, your iris repository, you see my iris has cut through here. And though it was not so, you know, I did, did the same procedure for the the other eye of this patient much earlier. So even trying to do a, a pupiloplasty in these cases becomes difficult because the iris just uh, cuts through on these cases. Here. So it just went ahead and uh, this one had a clear lens here and uh, again the graft oversizing is something which we do here and I always take about a 0.75 oversize on these cases here and did as much of a pupiloplasty which I could and uh, not very happy with the uh, with what was possible for this particular case. So this is the, uh, the left eye of this patient I think and recently done here and waiting for uh, the reports uh, and the results of, uh, of this particular case um, in the coming days here. I do agree that some of them uh, do land up with suture loosening even on the second uh, examination which we do a less easier for them and we might have to replace all the sutures. This is the fellow eye of that particular patient which was done in 2000 and 18 years which is almost uh, 6 years ago and this was a larger cornea compared to that eye and this cornea remained clear and um, and this is what encouraged me uh, to go ahead there is a small uh, anterior polar cataract in this patient so I think as Purli also rightly observed flat corneas, corneas are smaller here, microphthalmic globes sometimes an anterior polar cataract and 
commonly the severity of morbidity is not symmetrical. It is asymmetrical in both eyes is what I find in these cases is a talent. But uh, we really do not know which of these are really, um, the, the corneal epithelialization is going to be normal, which of these the limbus is so anomalous. So I think as Murli pointed out, looking at at least six or more of uh, palisades which are present is probably going to define that the epithelium is going to be healthy and E lower, even if they do graft projection, is a particular uh, uh, you know, danger which always looms large in most of these patients. So, to read more about it on preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative challenge, I would refer you to our um, the latest update on pediatric corneal disease and keratoplastics, which will probably give up. We'll throw more light and I think we'll save time for a little discussion in the end. Thank you, Madam, for that comprehensive any questions for any of the speakers? May I ask you, Mani? Yeah, I think, see, even I have a 20 years of experience in dealing with the pediatric uh, anterior segment. So each time when we have IC, I learn so much from these three women so that they have much more experience uh, over the years. And we pick up, we learn from each other and uh, we focus on, you know, doing these cases and doing uh, that we see. It's so important to, you know, each of these child have a 80 plus years of life expectancy at the time when we embark on a surgery. So, you know, it's very important to contain amyloby at any, any cost. That's what my, you know, perception dealing with these cases. A few things which I wanted to, you know, probably have our panel and we can learn from uh, your experiences. So now I think we have moved away from calling them as meters, meters class or looking at uh, uh, or calling them sclerocorneas as what uh, Dr. Ken Nestor strongly advocates. But I still feel calling them with what the way we used to call them is helpful at least for our fellows because they learn to uh, prognosticate prognosticate these cases and identify the morbidities or the problems which will probably arise depending upon the severity of what we are dealing with. For example, if I just see a blanket kid, it's, it's including all the, also a Peter's type 1, type 2 and a type 3 and we know that the prognosis is going to be grossly different from one end of the spectrum to the other end of the shoulder. So of course we moved on to name them as kids, you know, uh, keratoidodysgenesis or keratoidal. It's basically giving names for what we, you know, traditionally understood the way we trained here. So I, I think we know that the glaucoma in Peters 1 probably comes on much later, end of your first decade, or it starts affecting the posterior globe in the second decade, whereas a simple a Peters 2 and a Peters 3, you will have the severity of glaucoma much earlier on in life and the morbidity affecting the optic nerve is much more severe than the children, and the children tend to lose or the control or the, uh, the management for glaucoma is more refractory in these cases. Yeah. So I still, I mean that is how probably we all learned and that's how we identify to prognosticate our cases and that's something if you put them as a blanket ASDA it's really, really not going to help and, and of all the ASDAs Peters gives us Peters 1 and the type 1 gives us the best prognosis for most of our cases. The worst goes to the, the what we call the skills right now or the, the type 3 Peters. And again, I think what we also look at is uh, identifying congenital aphasias patients where they have corneal morbidities and these definitely do very poorly. And all the kills by the by 10 day, I find I've lost the 10 day, I've lost the graph with multiple procedures, I think. So, so that's something which is a very profile and that's something which we, we are still learning. I Lack of better terms, you know, we are at this point in time using a painter or sclerocardia. So it is a continuum, you know, look at developmental abnormality, so you have a, a different spectrum. So the, it's like always, you know, there is nothing called black and white, you know, shades of beauty. So you have two different poles. So the pole on the left side, which is a minor variant, they have much better prognosis. I think he is identifying them by, you know, focusing on such cases. Than, you know, a walking surgery and a severe case of senior family and this one out. Yes, sir, please. The red one is on point. Once you remove and tell me or whatever it is, can you undergo a last seat at later age to correct the feedback because the other part of the body is gone? Yeah, great question. Sir, if it is a grade one, it is insignificant. It is a less than one eighth of a cardia. I don't recommend, you know, surgical excision unless, you know, child is concerned about cosmesis. As Pina pointed out, they always have a, you know, significant astigmatism leading to amyloplasia. 
a possible I would recommend LASIK. The reason is you have a focal absence of limbal stem cells. So if your LASIK flap you know, were to go up to that, you have an interface inviting in epithelial downgrowth and so on. I don't recommend so. Maybe a PRK is a good option. Madam? Right. Thank you so much. So if there, there are any questions, we will yes take sir. it outside. One on one question. Yes, sir, please. Is there any relation of uh, stem cell deficiency with limbal dermoid? Yes, sir. They have a focal absence of, you know, congenital absence of limbus at the area of, uh, you know, where, where it's, it's mostly inferior temporal. That's where, you know, it's a junction between a mesoderm and ectoderm. So it's invariably 99% uh, you know, inferior temporally located. So stem cell deficiency? Yes, sir. There yes. is no limbus there. You're right. So limbal stem cell transplantation? Not needed, sir. Not Definitely. needed because it's a very small area. Unless it is more than, you know, eight clock hours. We have tried and become successful. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.